Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's live broadcast of Challenges and Opportunities in Biopharmaceutical Higher Order Structure and Conformational Stability Analysis, a focus on HDX applications. I'm Amy Ritter, Scientific Editor of Biopharm International and your moderator for today's event. We are delighted to bring you this educational web-based event presented by Biopharm International and sponsored by Thermo Fisher Scientific, a world leader in serving science. Thermo Scientific provides analytical technologies, reagents, consumables, services, and software from cutting-edge scientific research to routine industrial applications. This webinar is part of an educational series to provide solutions to pressing application challenges. We have a few important announcements before we begin. This webcast is designed to be informative, and we encourage you to ask questions during the event. You can type your questions in the Submit Questions box located below the presentation window. Due to the large number of participants, we may be unable to answer your questions live. You can enlarge the slide window at any time by clicking on the Enlarge Slides button located below the presentations window. The slides will automatically advance throughout the event. If you're experiencing technical problems with viewing or hearing this product, please click on the Help button below the presentation window. Joining us today is Dr. Yoshitomo Hamuro, the Senior Director of Technology Development at XR Corporation, and Dr. Eric Monroe, a postdoctoral fellow in the Department of Chemistry at the University of Arizona. Leading off today's discussion is Dr. Hamuro, a world leader in the HDX MS analysis of proteins. He was instrumental in the development of modern HDX technology while at the University of California, San Diego. Since joining XR in 2002, he has further developed XR's HDX platform technology while overseeing XR's research strategy for applications to drug discovery. Dr. Hamuro is also an adjunct associate professor of biochemistry and biophysics at the University of Pennsylvania. Thank you for joining us today. Dr. Hamuro, please get us started. Thank you, Amy, for kind introduction. Today, I'd like to talk about protein characterization by hydrogen deuterium exchange mass spectrometry, particularly epitope mapping and higher order structure analysis for protein therapeutics. What I'd like to do today is first explain how HD exchange works and then show a few examples of higher order structure analysis and epitope mapping. This slide is showing a generic structure of an, an oligopeptide. While there are many different types of hydrogen atoms on the peptide, we focus on backbone amide hydrogen shown in red. Many of these backbone amide hydrogens are exchanging with hydrogens in bulk solvent in second two days. Therefore, if you replace aqueous buffer with deuterated buffer, the backbone amide hydrogen will gradually exchange with deuterium atoms in the bulk solvent. Since deuterium atom is one Dalton heavier than hydrogen atom, if you can monitor the mass of the peptide, you can follow h 2 d exchange reaction in real time. This is what we do in the laboratory, starting from non-deuterated protein shown in top left. The green line is a protein backbone, and the blue dots are backbone amide hydrogens. Upon mixing with the deuterated buffer, typically at the neutral pH near physiological condition, blue dots will gradually exchange to red dots, which are deuterium atoms. After incubating in deuterated buffer for a predetermined duration, we can virtually stop HD exchange reactions by bringing down pH to around 2.5 and temperature to near zero degree. Now, we have to keep this low pH, low temperature condition throughout downstream processing. Partially deuterated and quenched proteins now proteolyzed and uh, LCMS analyzed to see which peptic fragments carry extra deuterium atoms upon deuteration. This slide shows physical chemical background of HD exchange reaction, showing a free energy diagram of HD exchange reaction in 50% D2O. If you can assume amide hydrogen completely exposed to the solvent, you can calculate HD exchange reaction rate from the pH, temperature, and the sequence of the protein. What this means is you can calculate 
delta G CH double dagger. Now, what we do in the laboratory is HD exchange of native state protein. Because protein is a dynamic entity, there's equilibrium between native state and open state. And what we measure during the HD exchange reaction is a whole process of starting from native state, opens up, exchange to deuterium, and go back to closed deuterated state. So at the end, what we can get is delta G EX double dagger. Now, because we know delta G CH double dagger and the delta G EX double dagger, what we can get is delta G EF. This is a free energy change upon folding. So in this sense, all backbone amide hydrogens act as thermodynamic sensors for a protein. This slide is similar to earlier slide. Starting from non-deuterated protein, we exchange deuterate, stop the reaction, proteolize, and LCMS analysis. We repeat this process several times with various reaction times. So at the end, what we get is deuterium buildup curve shown in here. X axis is the log of time, Y axis is the deuteration level of analyzed peptide. So if you can generate 50 peptides from your protein, we're going to generate 50 of this type of deuterium buildup curves. We typically present our data in color format shown at the bottom. Each block includes eight time points, in this case, from 30 seconds to 100,000 seconds. Deuteration level at each time point at each block is color-coded, as shown here. Blue means non-deuterated, red, me red means complete deuteration. In this particular example shown here, you can see red, blue, red, blue from left to right, meaning fast exchange region, slow exchange region, fast slow, meaning disordered region, ordered region, disordered and ordered. In this way, we can grasp dynamic properties of protein by just one glance. Now, in this slide, I'd like to share a couple of caveats for HD exchange mass spec practice. First thing is that I'd like to you to be aware that you have to have both good data generation system and good data extraction software to have efficient HD exchange practice. Most newcomers to the field tend to overlook the importance of data analysis software. For data generation, HD exchange mass spec practice is the fight against the clock. Once you quench your HD exchange reaction, you have less than 30 minutes, even at pH 2.5 at the zero degree, before you lose too much deuterium attached in the backbone amides. Because of this, some sort of automation is highly recommended, as Eric will describe in the following presentation. Also, since each project requires different protocol and poses different problems, you want automation with modular system to give flexibilities to your practice. Once you establish HD exchange system, the most time consuming step is data analysis. So it is also critical to have access to efficient data analysis software. Now, I'd like to talk about our example of protein's higher order structure analysis. This slide shows HD exchange of human growth hormone at the pH 2.7. We are interested in studying human growth hormone because it is the first biosimilar approved by European Union regulatory agency. Also, this protein is known to aggregate at low pH. Human growth hormone has a four helix bundle and the four helices are shown in light blue on top of the sequence. Overall, you can see color under blue cylinders are bluish, and the other regions are reddish. So this makes sense with the crystal structure, because you would expect four helices exchange slower and loop region exchange faster. 
Now let's take a closer look at a couple of segments. The first, segment 47 to 53. Red line is a duty and build up curve you can expect for this segment when the segment is completely exposed to the solvent at the pH and temperature. Green circles are observed due to the duration level. As you can see, red line and green circles are on top of each other, indicating this segment is completely exposed to the solvent. This makes sense because this is a loop region. Now, this is a segment 18 to 25. Again, red line is a deuterium build-up curve you can expect for this segment when the segment is completely exposed to the solvent at the pH and temperature, and green circles are observed deuteration level. In this segment, green data points shifted about two orders of magnitude toward right. This means HD exchange reactions in this segment is about 100 times slower than you would expect for random coil conformation. This slowdown effect is called protection factor. In this case, protection factor of 100 can be converted into 2.8 kilokel per mole of free energy change upon folding. Once we do analogous treatment for all the segments, we can convert all HD exchange data into free energy change upon folding for each segment. And now we can overlay the folding free energy value onto the X-ray crystal structure, as shown here. One of the strengths of HD exchange mass spec is its applicability. With HD exchange, we can monitor the protein's higher order structure in various conditions. Here we show the HD exchange patterns of human growth hormone at the four different pHs. The HD exchange data at the four different pHs can be converted into folding free energy at the four different pHs. First, let's look at the pH 7.5 data. You can see blue and green around four helices and orange and red in the loop region. So this is a dynamic property of human growth hormone near physiological conditions. Now, as lower the pH, the color gradually change from bluish to greenish to yellowish. Cut long story short, these data show two things. One, human growth hormones still have molten globular type structure even at the pH 2.7. Two, these enhanced dynamic properties at low pH are the likely cause of this protein's propensity for aggregation at low pH. Just to summarize the higher order structure characterization by HD exchange, I believe HD exchange have a potential to play a critical role in higher order structure characterization because of its wide applicability and medium resolution nature. The potential applications include formulation optimization, quality control, and application to biosimilar. I should point out that I am aware that at least one company already used HD exchange data for European Union regulatory filing. And also a few companies are preparing FDA filing with HD exchange data. So please don't miss the boat. Now, the last topic of my presentation is epitope mapping. This slide shows the best-selling drugs in 2010. Five out of top 12 drugs are therapeutic antibodies. Therapeutic antibodies are the fastest growing sector in pharmaceutical industry. Now, why do we care about epitope mapping? There are three major reasons scientific reason, intellectual property reason, and regulatory reason. This is a slide from Jennifer Nemeth of Janssen Research and Development. She listed various technologies which Janssen uses for epitope mapping. 
you can see a small red number on the shoulder of each technology. They are priority numbers. They try number ones first for epitope mapping. If they don't work, they would try number twos and number threes. HD exchange one of the number ones. This is my version of epitope mapping technology slide. X axis is the easiness of each technology. Y axis is the goodness of the data from each technology. I understand that this is oversimplified, but all the fairness, roughly speaking, high resolution data tends to be expensive and affordable technology may not be as reliable. The ideal technology should be at the top left corner. I place HD exchange in the center because of its medium throughput, medium resolution nature. One thing I want to point out is the compatibility with conformational epitope. If you survey antigen-antibody co-crystal structure in PDB, protein data bank, vast majority of them have conformational epitopes. Generally speaking, the methods above this yellow line are compatible with conformational epitopes. I believe HD exchange is the most accessible technology which is compatible with conformational epitopes. There are two protocols for epitope mapping by HD exchange, on-exchange protocol and on-off exchange protocol. This slide shows the concept of on-exchange protocol. Here, green circle is antigen, yellow rectangles are antibody. We run HD exchange of antigen in the presence and absence of its antibody. Peptic fragments, which show less deuteration in the presence of antibody, are the on-exchange identified epitopes. This slide shows the concept of on-off exchange protocol. Prior to this set of experiments, we have to immobilize the antibody and pack an affinity column. Now, starting from top left, antigen is incubated in deuterated buffer for on exchange. Then this deuterated antigen will be loaded onto affinity column and washed with aqueous buffer for off exchange. At this step, all deuterium atoms attached in the on exchange step will go back to hydrogen atoms except the ones at the epitope, which is now protected by antibody. Then introduction of acid will quench the HD exchange reaction and elute out the antigen from affinity column. After digestion and LCMS analysis, the peptic fragments which carry extra deuterium are the on exchange identified epitopes. This is epitope mapping of IL-17A against CAT2200 in collaboration with AstraZeneca. Rectangles are peptic fragments we can monitor. Blue and light blues are the HD exchange identified epitopes. Gray rectangles are non-epitope segments. This interaction has conformational epitopes. Once you overlay the HD exchange data onto crystal structure, these discontinuous segments nicely clustered at the one end of crystal structure. Our collaborator tried peptide method for epitope mapping. In this method, they digested IL-17 first and then checked which peptic fragments of IL-17 can bind to the antibody. The fragments which bind to the antibodies are the peptide-identified epitopes. So this is epitope identified by peptide method. This is epitope identified by HD exchange method. 
they provide self-consistent epitopes, but two methods disagreed completely. The savior for us came in the form of X-ray crystal structure. According to AstraZeneca, our HD exchange epitope is spot on with the contact residues identified by the crystal structure. So now they believe us. We wrote a paper together, and we continue a productive collaboration. This slide shows another example of epitope mapping by HD exchange. This is the epitope map of cytochrome C E8 antibody interaction in collaboration with the University of Pennsylvania. Here, blue rectangles are HD exchange identified epitope, and blue diamonds are contact residues identified by core crystal structure. If we look at the here and here, HD exchange and the core crystal structure agree very well. But if you look at this area, they disagree a little bit, presumably due to allosteric effects. To have a higher resolution, higher confidence for HD exchange data, we combined HD exchange data with computational docking. First, this slide shows the concept of standalone docking protocol for antigen antibody interaction. We start from antibody structure and antigen structure. Prior to docking, non-complementarity determining region of the antibody is marked as binding ineligible because we know that they are not involved in antigen-antibody interface. Then we dock antigen and blocked antibody and compare the results with core crystal structure. This slide shows the comparison between the core crystal structure and the top pose of the standalone docking. This is antigen. This is antibody in core crystal structure. This is antibody in the top docking pose. As you can see, they do not agree very well. Now, this is again the epitope mapping of cytochrome C8 antibody interaction by HD exchange. If you look at this data, you notice there are very few false negatives. False negatives are contact residues which are not identified by HD exchange. With that knowledge, we can modify the docking protocol. For antibodies, we can block non-CDR as a binding ineligible. And now we can also block non-HD exchange identified epitope as binding ineligible. And then we're going to dock and compare with our core crystal structure. So this is a docking without HD exchange constraint. This is a docking with HD exchange constraints. As you can see, core crystal structure and top pose of docking with HD exchange constraints are virtually indistinguishable. Now, with this success, it is possible that the combination with docking can make the HD exchange results more reliable and higher resolution and move up to higher position. This slide is the epitope mapping of TLR3 against two monoclonal antibodies in collaboration with Janssen Research and Development. Epitope mapping of TLR3 is more challenging because it is heavily glycosylated and almost 100 kilodalton, a relatively large protein. Nonetheless, we could identify the epitope of TLR3 against two different antibodies. Epitope against MAB-A is around 140 to 150 residues, and that against MAB-B is residues around 450 and also residues around 480 to 520. To summarize epitope mapping by HD exchange, 
Epitope mapping is a critical step for therapeutic antibody development for scientific, intellectual properties, and regulatory reasons. HD exchange is an excellent option for epitope mapping because of its wide applicability, medium resolution, medium throughput nature. Also, HD exchange is compatible with discontinuous conformational epitopes, can deal with glycosylated large proteins. Higher resolution may be achieved by combined with computational docking. Finally, I'd like to thank EXA team members, Steve Coles for automation, Catherine, Steve Tusky, and Kelly for data acquisition, and Dipangi for computational docking. Also, I'd like to thank our collaborators, Jennifer from Janssen for TLR3 study, Mark Abbott of AstraZeneca for IL-17 study, Ivan Patterson of University of Pennsylvania for site from C study. A part of the mapping study was supported by NIH. Thank you very much for your attention, and now get back to you, Amy. Thank you, Dr. Hamuro. Continuing today's presentation is Dr. Eric Munro. Dr. Munro received his PhD from the University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign, where he studied the distribution of biological compounds, including small molecules, neuropeptides, and proteins, in the nervous system of multiple animal models using MS profiling and imaging methodologies under the direction of Jonathan Swedler. He then moved to Peter Prevlage's lab at the University of Alabama, Birmingham, where he utilized structural MS techniques such as HDX to examine the structural basis of the HIV virus maturation pathway. This work has provided valuable insight not previously available. His research also identified the requirements for the formation of the essential N-terminal beta hairpin in the capsid protein, as well as its impact on the stability and orientation on, of the downstream alpha helix. He recently moved to the University of Arizona to work with Michael Hyen in the development of a novel mass spectrometer and to examine small molecule neurotransmitters and neuropeptides. Dr. Monroe, can you please continue with the presentation? Thank you, Amy, for the introduction. What I want to talk about today is some of the work that I did in the Privilege Lab and uh, utilizing hydrogen deuterium exchange mass spectrometry as uh, uh, Yoshi was so kind to introduce and uh, uh, go through and explain quite well how we actually do this. So what I'm going to try and show today is how we've adapted this uh, process to look at a wide range of various biological compounds. One aspect of the lab was working on retroviral assembly and maturation with the HIV viral capsid, while other uh, people in the group were working on uh, fundamental studies of bacteriophage, so viruses that in fact actually infect bacteria. In addition, we were looking at uh, utilizing these bacteriophage actually to serve as nanomaterial uh, scaffolds for use as either drug delivery uh, vehicles or in uh, some level of energy uh, 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 production. In addition, we had several different collaborations, one of which I'll pull data from throughout this talk, which is in collaboration with the Dawkin Lab at the University of Alabama at Birmingham, working with uh, the small uh, protein, it's uh, about an eight kilodalton protein that forms this dimer, that actually in the presence of uh, proteins from another bacteriophage infection uh, forced that the actual resultant particles to go from this 80 alpha large scale down to the SAPI-1, which is much smaller, it's about a third of the volume. And so we're interested in trying to understand how these things actually uh, cause the shift to occur. Now, as you might see here, that this is quite a ver uh, varied scale of, of projects, particularly from a single lab. And as I was the only mass spectrometrist in the group, we started to think about, well, once I'm not there and, and even while I'm there, what kind of things do we need to be able to use HD exchange mass spectrometry and a, a much better useful aspect of everyday lab workflow. So we came up with a, a number of challenges, one of which was that I was actually the only person that was classically trained in mass spec, and we had a large number of other uh, non-experts that needed to use these processes in the lab, i.e. they were all biologists who had really never seen or used a mass spectrometer. So we needed to make this very easy to use, as well as being 
highly reproducible. Um, we can verify this by using introducing randomization and then having other capabilities. So instead of just throwing our proteins into solution and watching them exchange, we wanted to be able to have tight temperature control as well as being able to modulate the exchange kinetics and the dynamics of these processes to open up other questions that we might be able to have. In addition, some of these compounds um, just did not uh, uh, digest under certain conditions. We want to be able to change our digestion conditions to open up a wide range of abilities to actually go through and try and answer as many questions as we possibly can, including the development of a, uh, an automated method in which to do various stability assays, which are particularly useful when we're adding all sorts of modifications and mutations into um, uh, the energy projects. Uh, uh, basically phase display methodologies. So we can actually distill all this down and begin to say, well, what we really need is we need a very flexible solution to this. Um, and so we looked around and ended up obtaining um, from Leap Technologies one of the, their HD Exchange sample handling robots. Now shown here is the actual uh, instrument at array where it has two uh, sample handling arms two temperature controlled boxes um, where the samples reside and where exchange happens, and a temperature controlled LC box which contains uh, three different valves, a pepsin column for digestion, a trapping column to trap peptides, and an analytical uh, column prior to allow us to separate these peptides prior to attaching or uh, electrospraying them into our mass spectrometer. In our case, that was a 7 Tesla FT-ICR from Thermo. Um, and so the typical workflow is your sample is set at, at 4 degrees centigrade in one ninety-six well plate or sample vial, something like that. And the robot takes that sample, moves it over to a other temperature control box here, for instance, just showing it's at 20 C, so room temperature, to initiate exchange. And after a period of time, um, similar to as Yoshi was explaining, that we want to quench this reaction. So the sample is then moved from the exchange plate over into the cold quench where the, the sample is quenched and then immediately injected on to, um, uh, through the LC valves to go through the pepsin column, then trapped and eluded into the column. Now, this is the standard workflow, and they've got nice software to be able to do that. But we thought, well, how can we actually go through and expand this? So in order to, to do this, we basically thought, well, instead of three plates, why not use four? And that allows us to separate out things a little more and um, in addition, take out that pepsin column. Sometimes we add that back. But here, for instance, in solution exchange, we keep our exchange buffers and our sample and do our actual exchange all at one temperature. We store our quench at another and do our digestion at, at on, an, 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 on a fourth plate. And so what this really allows us to do is to, to open up um, a number of different experiments, particularly as we can basically change what is on each plate as needed. This is, of course, all backed up by a large number of, of software settings that so actually allows us to um, perform rapid modifications to these experiments. So just to give you an idea here, we can basically change um, the location of our labeling plate, our quenches, all of that kind of concept, as well as having a large number of different timing um, uh, steps that we can actually modify, as well as various speeds for various aspects of the PAL system itself. Now, this allows us to do a lot of modification but um, and, and basically tweaking in the various uh, experiments, which is very helpful. Now, one thing that the software didn't typically allow was randomization of, of samples. So rather than running, for instance, all of our 30-second time points and then our one-minute time points and then our two-minute time points, as the software uh, kind of requires, in that the samples are run in increasing order of exchange period, um, we found that, well, we can basically do an import-export trick by taking, setting up our, our large experiment, throwing that into an Excel file, which then randomizes it into a selected number of individual bins, which are then ordered in increasing time scale. So here I'm showing um, a, a, an experiment run in triplicate from zero seconds to uh, 60 minutes of exchange run in five bins. So what you see is that now each bin is actually involved or has, is ordered in increasing exchange time, but overall we have kind of a pseudo-randomization to make sure that we're not in inner, or 
we are not causing any sort of um, effect on, as a result of instrument drift or something like that. Um, so once we have this workflow down, then we can start to think, well, actually, how well can we actually get this to reproduce? Now here um, is this uh, SAPI-1 GP6 protein that I'll talk about uh, quite a bit throughout the rest of the talk, just as a, a generic sample. And this is a, that helix, loop helix dimer, um, which uh, chain is involved in scaffolding of, uh, of and size determination of a novel bacteriophage. But uh, here I'm just kind of showing that, well, actually this automation can greatly improve our, our reproducibility. So in my best days in doing some of these manual preps, I can get down to about 5% RSD and deuterium incorporation at any given time point. Um, I think my best was in the 2 to 3%, but 5 to 10 was kind of everyday standard. But following um, tweaking in these experiments, either in the intact protein or an actual uh, peptic digest fragment, um, was able to get the RSDs consistently down to 1% or even below 1%. What this allows us to do is then start to tease apart much more subtle shifts in protection and protein stability in samples, and otherwise we might be able, to, we would not be able to see, for, for instance, in doing that manual preparation strategy. So we have very reproducible exper or uh, measurements now, and so we thought, well, okay, one thing that that uh, Yoshi mentioned was that temperature is actually quite important in controlling these experiments in that, uh, for instance, at uh, higher temperatures, we tend to have faster exchange as the protein uh, or the kinetics are increased, where we quench at very low temperatures and, and low pH. So one thing that's important, particularly when we're doing this, as our samples can actually, these drawers can actually be open for a uh, minute or two at time during sample preparation was to have very stable temperatures. So here's a, a picture of this uh, setup where we have our two temperature control drawers. And what we've done is put PCR uh, uh, temperature plates um, underneath our, our sample handling. And what this allows us to do is to keep our temperature steady for well over five minutes with less than a, a tenth degree centigrade change over this time, which is really more or less the noise of the IR thermometer that we're using to measure these things. Um, and so we really need this because we're off in the privilege lab, we're often sample limited. So we're producing uh, HIV virus-like particles or even in vitro assembly. So we have relatively little quantity of sample, which of course then leads to very little thermal mass. So we could actually have temperature changes relatively quickly. Um, and since we're sample limited, we need these small volumes. Um, so having this actually at a stable temperature was quite helpful. In addition, we can then start to mess with uh, various temperatures. So we can either do our exchange at, for instance, 10 or 4 degrees centigrade, and then see what we can do as far as changing our, our kinetics. Back to this GP6 molecule, it, it actually is, this, again, this dimer that has a four helix bundle. And what we observe during exchange in whole protein analysis, for instance, is that we see two different families of exchange. We have this EX1 mechanism and an EX2 mechanism. Briefly, EX1 occurs when the protein unfolds and um, all of the uh, available uh, uh, amide protons exchange prior to the refolding of the protein, which is different from uh, the EX2 mechanism whereby a protein has to breathe multiple times in order for the exchange to occur. Um, EX2 appears to be much more uh, common However, the EX1 can open up some really interesting protein dynamics. And if you catch this kind of in the middle of, of either being in a completely closed or open state here, open being uh, the red, we see this bimodal distribution of exchange. So we thought, well, this protein appears, or this uh, protein dimer appears relatively similar to uh, uh, that from a different system that the lab has much more uh, experience in. And Previously, we were able to, to freeze out these mo this motion and the, this EX2 uh, breathing mechanism, or sorry, EX1 breathing mechanism. So we, we tried that experiment and, and found that, well, actually, it's notably different from this previous um, experiment. But so here on the left shows a series of exchange at 20C and then one at 4. And what we see is that the point at, or the, the dynamics of this EX2 to EX1 um, exchange 
uh, profile does change as the basis of the temperature. And so this is allowing us to start to examine this breathing mechanism and understand how it's going on since we've been basically able to change the half-life of this opening from 75 seconds down to about 130. And so we've done a number of different experiments here um, trying to understand exactly what's going on um, and the dynamics of this breathing and is it actually biologically relevant in how it operates in the system. So rather than go all into the details of the biology as I'm here um, trying to sh show how we can use this, this instrument for this flexibility is to, to understand, well, not only do we need um, some nice temperature control games and um, the reproducibility, but actually expanding our options for these experiments. So looking at uh, the kind of the standard mechanism of, of automation is the bar standards basically using an immobilized pepsin column for digest. However, in some of our experiments, we and samples, we were seeing that we really weren't having very good digestion. Um, and in, to, in order to adapt to this, we needed to either add different columns, which is a little more expensive and tricky to build, or we can just go and use solution phase digest by um, utilizing a, a proteolytic digestion in a plate, similar to what some of the, the manual kind of experiments do. Um, and so just as an example here, um, looking just in, in a pepsin digest of this four helix bundle uh, dimer protein, we see we have a lot of peptides here shown by these little underline or these lines underneath the protein sequence. We see we have a large number of, of uh, peptides that, that span the C-terminal uh, half of this protein. However, that's really just a floppy region in the structure as determined by NMR and um, really not interesting to us in understanding, this, in understanding the dynamics of this protein. Instead, we have two peptides that cover um, the first component of this, these helices. However, where the two helices cross in the center of this four helix bundle, we actually had no coverage at all with pepsin, which was very difficult as uh, yet the, our collaborators had found that actually several of these residues were actually critical for not only uh, protein folding but also their function. Um, via mutagenesis. So we moved and looked at uh, here's protease type 13. We actually did a couple of other um, uh, acid proteases. And so now we actually have quite good coverage across both the N-terminal component and the C-terminal as well as uh, the, the center of this four helix bundle, which allows us to look at um, much more interesting dynamics as, uh, and, and begin to answer some actual biological questions rather than just uh, uh, playing with fun data. So that opened up uh, a number of other different experiments, and we started to think, well, okay, we've, we've got all of this. Can we actually um, automate something um, that was uh, uh, presented by Go at all several years ago, which is utilizing um, uh, titrations of guanidine under exchange conditions? So rather than kind of the standard HD exchange methodologies where we change the time at which uh, a sample is incubated in the, de in the deuterated buffers. Here we have a, a set time under exchange, but we, we titrate in guanidine in order to, to understand the stability of protein assemblies, um, which, was used, which we're using quite uh, a, a fair amount in understanding. Um, here's the HIV capsid lattice, which is a hexameric lattice made up of the HIV capsid protein, which is this two-domain uh, protein down here in uh, Blue and dark blue and light blue, it forms this hexameric ultrastructural lattice, and we under, wanted to see how various mutations change the strength of that lattice. And this again was very in, uh, useful in understanding the effects of our mutations that we were adding during uh, uh, development of some of these uh, uh, nanoparticle-based uh, uh, either drug delivery systems or uh, energy. Uh, uh, collectors. So what we tended to see was, or would we expect to see, is that we have a set amount of exchange over uh, a range of guanidine concentrations and then a rapid um, increase in the number of deuterons that are incorporated um, at increasing guanidine, which corresponds based roughly to the uh, uh, either breakup of the lattice and or the unfolding of the protein. Um, so really this was relatively trivial to automate um, in that we can just replace our normal D2O buffers with guanidine 
uh, inclusive buffers and run for the exchange, same exchange time and then just collect a lot of data and see what happens. So here's just showing how we actually did that, where we have our D2O and our guanidine going through and using our acid protease and our digestion in the plate, since uh, the capsid is one of the proteins we weren't having very good luck with digesting. And so looking at just the HIV capsid protein by itself uh, does not appear to actually undergo this cooperative unfolding, which would result in that uh, uh, big increase at one single guanidine concentration, um, but kind of expected as it's a multi uh, domain protein with a large quantity of alpha helices, so it's probably basically alpha helices slowly losing their interactions rather than one big jump. But we thought about, well, what happens in uh, digest or in an assembled state? So looking at, instead of the whole protein, looking here at uh, a peptide that uh, covers basically two alpha helices that are involved in uh, or are uh, nestled near the center of this uh, uh, hexamer, but actually don't contain uh, intermolecular interfaces. Um, in the monomer, we see something, we see similar kind of non-cooperative uh, unfolding mechanism, whereby if we started to look at um, uh, this peptide in the assembled state, we see uh, actually two different uh, components of exchange, one of which um, uh, is here in the, and to the left, and another we have then see that large jump. And so what it suggests is that the actual formation of this intermolecular interface, even though, um, and the formation of the hexamer, even though this peptide is not involved as, um, in this forming these interfaces as determined by various crystal structures and some other HD exchange experiments we had done previously, um, suggests that, well, the formation of this uh, hexamer actually stabilizes the actual structure of the protein even when um, there's no direct involvement. And so we've basically shown that we can utilize the flexibility afforded by this uh, uh, sample handling robot connected with our, our FTMS to really make HD exchange a regular work portion of our workflow um, where we can just use it to the auto samplers, auto samplers, set it up for overnight runs or over the course of a day. And um, it, outside of, of interpretation and, and actually collecting some of the spectrum, optimizing initial strategies. Once the workflow is developed, it's relatively easy for even the, the not standard non-expert non to come in and produce a quite nice data. Um, so we have the ability to control temperature, have highly reproducible and um, uh, experiments at relatively high throughput, um, particularly for just being a simple um, academic lab. And again, we have this use of non-experts, which was absolutely imperative. Um, and again, we can also randomize our samples, um, change protein dynamics by changing, t playing temperature games, as well as opening up new uh, digestion strategies and uh, stability assays using Suprex. All right, and so with that, I want to uh, be remiss to uh, suggest that I did all of this work by myself. Instead, I'd rather, or I need to acknowledge uh, various people that are involved. Uh, my boss was at uh, UAB, Peter Privilege and various members of the lab, David Morris, James Chua, Rui Lee. In addition, uh, Matt Renfro and, and Leanne Borma, who uh, were the other mass spectrometrists involved in obtaining the LEAP instrument and the FTMS, as well as kind of guiding me towards what kind of other experiments might need to be performed with these uh, uh, sets of equipment to open up, again, some of that flexibility that, we would, that people would be desiring. In addition, um, uh, members of the Terry Dockland lab, uh, particularly with the GP6 project and some others we've been working on. Um, Altera Dearborn, who is uh, getting ready to defend some of the GP6-based work, as well as Michael Spillman, her lab mate, who um, was involved in the initiation of some of those. And then Peter Smith from Leap Technologies, who's been a big help in uh, helping me learn the Leap software and open up some of the uh, uh, abilities and capabilities of all of the modifications of various uh, settings the instrument is actually capable of doing. Again, all of this work was actually performed at the University of Alabama at Birmingham, although I'm at Arizona now, and uh, all afforded through various funding um, aspects from the National Institutes of Health. And with that, I'll gladly turn it back over to Amy, um, and I think we'll go to questions from there. Thanks. Thank you for that informative presentation.
before we get started on the questions and answer session, I would like to remind our audience how to submit questions. Please type your questions in the small text box located in the lower left-hand side of your screen, and when finished, click the Submit button. Please note that due to time constraints, our speaker may not respond to all questions submitted. And our first question is for Dr. Monroe. With your concern for temperature stability, why are the drawers held open for several minutes? It would seem that just closing the drawers right when needed would be a simpler solution. Right. So in some of our longer time exchange experiments, we do actually have the doors closed. However, um, there is a period of time that it takes for the robot to actually do the sample handling, and we had found that this is somewhere in the area of 75 seconds with as, about as quick of motions as we were able to, uh, to get the, the robots to perform. And so for up until about the two-minute time point of exchange, the doors are, are open, and what this allows us to do is to access much shorter time points so we can get down into uh, two or three seconds of exchange where if we open and close the doors, then... Um, it, the time points become much longer and before we can actually uh, collect the data. Okay, thank you. And our next question is for Dr. Hamuro. What happens to the hydrogens on hetero atoms in the side genes? Okay, the hydrogens on hetero atoms in side chains, such as the ones on lysine, arginine, serine, theronine, exchange faster than backbone amide hydrogens. Uh, therefore, I assume when HD exchange reactions over, they are most likely all deuterated. However, the deuterium atoms on these side chains uh, will go back to hydrogens during the downstream processing, such as uh, proteolysis and the LC separation, since those steps are in aqueous environment. Okay, and for Dr. Monroe, how does the robot deal with throughput? You have to collect a time course of exchange data, and it would seem that pre prepping samples one at a time as your workflow mentioned, would seem to make large dead times. Right, so we do have some dead time. However, the software does actually um, uh, work to stack various samples. So for instance, um, if we have two one hour time points that are back to back and our experiments, or LC experiments take 15 minutes, it'll actually begin to prep basically as many things as it can. So it, it has a timing mechanism to it. Um, I didn't talk about it, um, just in the case of what was available for me to show here. Um, but it does actually do multiple preps, and then everything is just basically sitting in the plate exchanging prior to uh, um, the quenching. And so we can have four, five, six, seven, ten experiments actually doing the exchange point at, at a given time, and then it knows that each run takes 15 minutes. Um, and so then it, it can actually time out where in the workflow it needs to be and prep many things at once. So it's not near of an issue as it might initially have seemed. Okay, thank you. Um, Dr. Romero, what kind of mass spectrometers and HD exchange platform are you using? Uh, we use Thermos Orbitrop XL with ETD. We actually changed our mass spec from um, Thermos LCQ to Orbitrop about a year and a half ago. Uh, we appreciate the high resolution, the high mass accuracy of Orbitrop for HD exchange research for both peptide identification step and for exchange experiments. For platform, we do not use any commercially available HD exchange platform. We have our own in-house developed automated system. As I alluded during my talk, different projects require different types of HD exchange experiments, and different projects also pose different problems. At the end, you need the flexibility in your data acquisition system and the capability to troubleshoot. To achieve these goals, we ended up constructing our own automated system based on wild, widely applicable um, lab automation and uh, LC system. Okay, and another one for Dr. Homero. Yep. Is it possible to sublocalize the deuterium by MS MS? Yeah, so this is a question we start getting more and more. Um, MS MS sublocalization of deuterium atoms, particularly by ETD, is a very, very hot topic. Uh, Thomas Jorgensen is the leader of the effort. Um, there are a couple of papers uh, recently uh, describing ETD sublocalization of uh, deuterium uh, combined with bottom-up HD exchange um, experiment of a protein. Um, we are also working on ETD deuterium sublocalization in-house. Um, ETD with Orbitrop works actually very well for model peptides. 
So the next issue for us, um, um, sensitivity issue and the applicability to deal with um, uh, various peptides generated in a protein digestion. Okay, Dr. Monroe, how biologically significant is the breathing mechanism that you were trying to tease apart? And do you have any data if the breathing results in the dime are falling apart? Right, so we're still working on whether or not it's biologically relevant or not, um, but as it's kind of a, a standard for what we can actually play with is, uh, while we see the breathing mechanism in the whole protein, if we actually start to look at all of our digest data and looking at individual peptides, we actually don't see any bimodally exchanging peptide. Now, the reason for this, and I mean, it sounds disparate initially, is that uh, we do, however, see some peptides that only undergo EX1-based exchange. So either they are completely protected or they're completely non-protected. And so what this is suggesting is that, yes, once we, it, the protein does actually breathe, that dimer interface comes apart. And so then the region that otherwise is quite stable and very well protected, the center of that four helix bundle, then completely exchanges. And so by looking at both whole protein and digest uh, uh, digested peptides by not only increasing our scale, but we're able to basically see that EX1 plus EX2 mechanisms does lead to the formation of this bimodal, which otherwise we wouldn't have been able to see. Dr. Humaro, our last questions are related to applicability of HD exchange mass spectrometry. Is there size limitation? Can you deal with glycoproteins? Uh, yes, th those are very important questions. Um, there is no theoretical size limitation for HD exchange mass spec. Uh, we feel pretty good about protein under 100 kilodalton. The largest protein we have dealt with is about 200 kilodalton. Um, the sequence coverage of the, that protein was about 60% using the old uh, LCQ machine. Typically, we expect the gradual decrease in sequence coverage by peptic fragments for proteins larger than 100 kilodalton. But maybe I should mention that the monoclonal antibody is 150 kilodalton, but we consider that protein as a 75 kilodalton because those are uh, dimeric form in a way. So typical sequence coverage of monoclonal antibodies is 95% or higher. Um, for um, glycoproteins, um, we are working with an increasing number of glycoproteins nowadays. The major issue of glycoprotein is um, peptide identification. If you don't know the glycans attached, we have just no chance to identify the peptides, including that glycosylation site. So we're going to miss the sequence coverage around each glycosylation site if you don't know what kind of glycans are attached. Um, another issue of um, uh, glycoprotein stems from its heterogeneity. Since glycans are usually heterogeneous, the population of each glycopeptide is usually lower than the typical uh, non-modified uh, modified peptide. So this makes the detection of glycopeptides more challenging than unmodified peptides. However, we have done quite a lot of um, glycoproteins, and now I think um, they are doable. Thank you both for your insight. Unfortunately, we're out of time. I'd like to thank the audience for their interesting questions and participation in today's event. I would also like to thank our sponsor, Thermo Fisher Scientific, for making today's educational webcast possible. Please note, this webcast will be available for on-demand viewing through March 27, 2013. You will receive an email from BioPharm International alerting you when this webcast will be available for replay. Please invite your colleagues to view the on-demand by forwarding them the announcement. See you next time. Goodbye.